Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am pleased to present today's speaker, Mr. Phil Robb, with the uh, Hewlett Packard Company. And Phil is actually the general manager of FossBazaar.org. And I had the pleasure of meeting him at in Linux Conf AU this year. And he was nice enough to offer to come in and give us a tech talk on what is Fossology and FossBazaar and why do we care? Take it away, Phil. Thanks, Leslie. Um, so, this talk, by and large, is going to be about governance and managing open source inside of a, a corporate environment or an institutional environment. And by and large, particularly for developers, that's not typically the most entertaining or interesting discussion that one might care to have, um, but still one that, that is, is kind of important, so I'm going to talk about it anyway. Um, so I'll first start off talking about me, um, who I am, what I do. Uh, talk a little bit about HP and what we do with um, free and open source software, or FOSS. Uh, user innovation networks, touch upon those a little bit, um, as well as FOSS's adoption curve and where we see it. Um, and I'll go into a little bit about why open source software is different than third party commercial software that uh, is currently mostly installed inside of um, institutions and uh, enterprises today. Then I'll talk about what FOSS Bazaar is and what Fossology is and what we're trying to do with those. So first, who am I? Um, so software engineer since about 1982, um, mostly doing Unix internals and, uh, and networking stack work. Uh, term full-time manager in 1999 and uh, much to my chagrin, haven't coded that much since then. Uh, so now I try to find other ways to contribute to such efforts. Um, started working with open source software when I joined HP in 2001. And one of my first tasks there was to work on their open source review board and their open source review policy. And this was back when HP was just getting a good handle on the amount of open source that we were using and the value that it could bring to the company. So we wanted to be able to manage it, understand it, manage it within our environment. Um, currently, I manage the open source program office um, which includes that open source review board, as well as coordinate HP's involvement with the open source technical conferences um, and lead our general governance tools and uh, consulting work. Um, and then, as Leslie mentioned, I'm also the general manager of FOSS Bazaar. <coughs> so, a little background on HP and open source, because I think, as, as I look at HP and I look at other companies, we may be using open source in more ways than any other company that I can think of because we have such a broad variety of products. Um, we certainly use it internally um, with things like Jabber and, and our email, our open LDAP infrastructure, our entire directory services infrastructure is based on open LDAP. Um, we also incorporate it into most of our software products. We ship full distributions of uh, open source software and we embed uh, open source into all of our or into many of our hardware products, including digital uh, printers, cameras, our storage devices, and so forth. And then we're also active participants in the community. So in, in a way, it's kind of like Google as well, in that I think Google started and was young enough as a, as a company that you were able to create the company around open source and be able to utilize it as best as possible, whereas most organizations have a legacy infrastructure, they have a legacy set of processes that they're used to working with around commercial software. So Google, unlike most organizations, had the benefit of creating your own policy and processes around how to use software, including open source software, at your, uh, at your creation. <coughs> so I'm going to talk now a little bit about user innovation networks, because that's that's the essence of what FOSS Bazaar is, and it kind of encompasses also open source software. So um, there's a guy by the name of Eric Von Hippel, teaches out, of, um, teaches out of MIT Sloan School, and he's written a book called um, uh, Democratizing Innovation. And in that, in that book, he really tries to evaluate and understand how innovation is changing and who's doing the innovating is changing from large corporate entities with large research budgets to individuals who have the ability to contribute now. 
And that happens because um, you know, the, the definition of a, of a user innovation network is some group of people with a common objective or a common problem to solve. All right, and they have some method of communicating so that uh, they don't have to be in the same room, they don't have to be in the same time zone, they have some method of, of working together across those, that space and time. Um, they have a set of tools that allow them to collaborate uh, and, and work together on projects. And over time, cultures evolve and policies within that organization, that self-forming organization occur so that um, they can actually become very effective in their efforts. So the end result is you know, many individuals contribute small amounts of intellectual property, and the end result is often far larger than the sum of its parts. And um, if that sounds familiar, I mean, that's, that's very much what open source does, right? Large disparate group of people, common problem, common set of tools that they want to understand, common set of tools that they want to build, or some problem that they want to solve with software. <clears throat> they get together within that organization and they build something. So, so free and open source software is actually one of the best first examples of a true innovation network, a user innovation network. Um, if you recognize the picture on the right, that's, uh, that's from Lars, that's a, it's a photo mosaic. And I thought it did a really good job of depicting um, you know, all of the individuals come together and the end result is this extremely powerful um, distribution called Debian. <coughs> But you know, developers and system ad administrators, again, started off, particularly with Linux, back in the early days. They had a problem they wanted to solve. They had a tool. They created it. They threw it out there on the net. They said, here, you might find this useful. I did. And what ends up happening is it comes back, and somebody's added a feature to it. Hey, this was cool. It didn't quite solve my problem, but I, 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 added, this, I added this piece of functionality, because that's what I needed. So take that back. And then ends up building upon it, building upon itself, right, as, as more and more folks get into that community. Um, the web has provided that frictionless information or frictionless communication method. And tools such as Google Search, so that these folks can find each other, Bugzilla, IRC, um, email, of course, Subversion. These are all tools that, that these developers use um, to be able to collaborate. And you know, depending on the project that you're talking about, there are different cultures that grow out of those organizations as well. Debian has a pretty unique culture, right? And they're very good at defining what their culture is, defining what their policy is, what they believe in, writing it down, and making sure that it's enforced. <clears throat> they're one of the best examples of a self-forming organism right, that has been able to do that. So, while free and open source software is one of the first best examples of a user innovation network, there are actually many more. They're more in their infancy than Linux or most open source projects are. Um, but some examples are uh, the early sailboarding community. This is one of the first examples in, uh, in Eric von Hippel's book, where he talks about how people were trying to, you know, trying different ways of lacing their feet to the board and the different size of the sails and you know, getting pretty much impaled um, and slammed into the water when things didn't go right in those early, in those early prototypes. And they kept working, they kept building. Um, and some of those early adopters, some of those very beginning um, users ended up going into business. They started making boards. They started, they continued to innovate, they continued to work with their group of, of um, of hardcore early adopting users, and they ended up building this, um, building a business out of being able to, to um, bring sailboarding to the masses. Um, Chris Anderson is the guy who uh, kind of talks about the long tail, where I would also put Foss Bazaar, which is why I'm interested in Chris Anderson. Right? Not a whole lot of people care about open source governance, but the web is one is 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 a nice medium to actually allow. You know, many, many, many different types of groups with very specific interests come together and solve problems together. <clears throat> Chris Anderson, um, in his latest endeavor, he's got a website there, uh, do-it-yourself drones, because he and his son are really interested in unmanned craft. Um, and it's an entirely open source project. It's hardware based, right? It's, you know, designs from everything from the control boards to the engines to um, what the crafts uh, wingspans need to be and so forth. 
but it's all about um, it's all about just trying to trying to trying to build um, drones, uh, you know, unmanned flight uh, vehicles on your own. Today's educational communities are the same way, right? We see more and more groups who are collaborating with best practices on how do I teach my kid X, right? You can go to different websites, you can learn, you can learn, you know, what's the best way to teach division if they're having this kind of problem, or what's the best way to get my kid to remember history, or whatever, right? And it's the same type of thing. Now, it's not just being left up to the teachers because the users, or the parents in this case, have the ability to collaborate, and they have a means and a mechanism to be able to do that. Foss Bazaar, is also a user innovation network. And it's kind of different in that it's focused on open source software, but it's not focused on development. It's not focused on code or code creation. It's actually focused on what are the best ways to actually manage open source inside of an organization. And here's, here's why I think that matters. So, I think we can look at open source software and its adoption in uh, many, many organizations and it's, um, it's, uh, it's very much in its early adopter phase. So if you look at um, you know, the, the, the original uh, categories of innovation, there's an early adopter phase, right? there's an innovator phase, an early adopter phase, early majority and late majority. Right? And Clayton Christensen's book talked about how right in here, or rather right in here, between early adopters and early majority, there's this chasm, right? Because early adopters are, um, certainly they're developers and, 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 and the sysadmins who, who want to work with open source, but they're also companies who are okay taking the pain of understanding and working with some new technology. They take the time, they take the effort to understand it so that they can use it as a technical differential advantage to themselves when they're, um, when they're working and competing in the marketplace, right? The early majority is, they, they carry the extra burden to the developers that the early majority has to have something that is easily consumable by them, right? It either has to fit the existing processes that exist inside of that organization or it has to be around long enough that it's fully understood by that early majority, right? And if you look at managers inside of a typical, um, typical uh, organizations around the world, be it enterprises, institutions, or governments, that's the barrier that they're facing right now with open source, right? Many of them actually are just coming to the realization that they've got a bunch of open source in their organization and they didn't know it was there, right? And we'll get to that in a minute. <clears throat> but when they do realize it's there, they have a whole bunch of questions that are unanswered because open source is new enough that it, 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 it isn't easily explained to them. And we'll, we'll talk about those in a minute. So regardless, open source continues to march on. Open source continues to permeate organizations. Um, 2007, 2008, 2010, open source will be in 80% of the infrastructure and 20% of the business software investments. So those are numbers from Gartner. Um, and you can watch. You know, the good thing about the analyst firms is that you know, once there is some kind of a trend that can build, their estimates get relatively accurate. And they, don't, they haven't changed these numbers for a while now. They're only small variations. So it's pretty well understood that there is a trajectory of open source um, uh, penetration into organizations. And it continues to grow. So why is open source different than any other um, software? And what are these things that, that, that matter around governance for open source? There's one thing that commercial software you have to go through when you're working with it in development, and that's procurement. So you know, these are the people that you typically don't like to talk to um, because they have all these questions and they have all these requirements, and all you want is this piece of software, right? Be a user, be it a user, be it a developer. You know, there's only one thing you want, but you got to go talk to him, right, to get it. <clears throat> and they ask all these questions. You know, their job is to make sure the number of suppliers to the company is as small as possible, right? Make sure that you get the absolute best price you possibly can for that software. Make sure that that company is viable 
and is going to be around in 10 years. Make sure that you understand what the SL, what the service level agreement is and what the support contract looks like, right? These are the things that procurement cares about and they track for the company whenever any kind of software asset is brought in or any other asset as far as that goes, right? So with open source, it's the one thing that's missing. Because open source can be so easily acquired, you don't have to have anybody cut a check, you don't have to have anybody um, you know, pay an outside vendor, so you don't have to go through procurement. You can just pull the software down off the web. So then what does that mean as far as challenges with bringing open source software in? Well, here are the questions that you need to answer, right? And I give this same talk fundamentally to both managers and to developers. And when I talk to the managers, I say, these are the questions you should be asking. And when I talk to the developers, I say, these are the questions that you should already have answers to when you go to your management and you want to use this software. <coughs> Excuse me. So how is it acquired, right? How are you actually pulling it down? How is it coming into the organization? How is it chosen? So how mature is it? How did you select that particular package? Are there other organizations inside of your company who need similar technology and are you working with them? So you're making sure that you're not pulling different versions or, or different packages um, from different places when you don't have to. How is it used and where? Um, meaning, you know, depending on the license, is it intermingled with proprietary code, is it not? Um, is it used for external consumption out on the web? Is it strictly used internally? Those are the questions. How is it supported, right? And there are multiple levels of support. There's self-support, which is absolutely perfectly okay. Um, there are places where you can go to get support like Red Hat for, for major componentry and, and, and full Linux distributions. Um, and then there's these integrator support providers, folks like OpenLogic or Source Labs or uh, Spike Source, where they'll take some set of op open source components, integrate them into a stack, and then support them for you. Um, Self-support works just fine, but you gotta make sure that you've got somebody in your organization who will be around and who will be available to actually support a production environment um, in that case. So how is it updated and how is it secured? Again, typically when I talk to developers, they bring the, open, they bring the code in and there isn't any plan to actually track the vulnerabilities, keep things up to date. Um, and for software, particularly that's exposed to the outside, that's a real problem. How is the project tracked? Who's gonna track the project? Make sure that it's still following the same technology path that the company wants to follow. Um, make sure that it's still viable. Make sure that there aren't any rifts occurring, that there's still a vibrant community around it because you have to plan if some project is being um, obsoleted from some other project, you have to know at what point would you move? Would you stay? Would you continue to invest more resources in that project to keep it alive? Those are the decisions that those responsible for the management of that software have to be able to answer. Then a big one um, for many companies uh, is how is it licensed? One of the problems with open source software is that because there are so many different open source projects, licenses are, um, there are many more licenses than there are with commercial software. A benefit of being able to go to one vendor and purchase software is you may really hate the license that they give you, but there's only one. So you only have one to track. <coughs> and then how mature is the software? Again, how long has it been around? Um, how good is the documentation? Uh, how many con contributions does the project get on a weekly or a monthly basis? How often do they rev? How often do bugs occur? So governance is really then talking about all of those issues. And again, from a developer standpoint, usually you know, developers don't care that much about any of those particular aspects um, or, it, or it's not their responsibility. So, but open source governance then is really not about um, helping the, the developer to understand what's necessary to work with the community to be able to interact with uh, open source developers and be able to um, you know, pull information from them, get, get fixes and patches um, and enhancements back into the project. That's not what we're talking about here in governance. Here, we're talking about the rest of the organization 
that's responsible for open source software that aren't developers, because these are the folks who really don't understand what open source is about. So these are the engineering managers, the CTO's office, CIO's office, the procurement folks, and legal. We, uh, at HP, we went out and we started talking to our customers and our, our, our good early adopters around open source, and we started asking these questions, because these are all things that HP, inside of our governance program, kind of work with. <clears throat> and we started asking them, so what do, what do you do in these areas? Because we were looking for best practices, right? And we were really shocked to find that, and this was two years ago, we were really shocked to find that most of them didn't do anything. Um, they didn't understand the issues, and they didn't really, um, they hadn't really thought about what policies and processes they need to put in place. So that's when we started thinking, well, it might be a good idea if we could create some place where early adopters, folks who are comfortable with using open source, could continue to further its um, understanding to those who haven't worked with it enough or haven't managed it enough. And then also just to get an industry consensus. What is a best practice, right? So that's what FOSS Bazaar is about in a nutshell. Um, and it covers these four areas, right, as I, as I discussed in the previous slide. Planning and strategy, so what is your open source strategy? When and why do you want to use open source? The maturity assessment of the open source software that you want to bring in. What is your policy? And that comes from you know, understanding licenses and legal compliance, understanding your IP risk, understanding the maturity of the software as it comes in, understanding how you track the projects. Um, knowing exactly what open source you have in your organization. Again, we continue to find when we work with customers that they know they have some open source out there, that, but they're not really sure where or how much. And when we help them figure that out, it's always an order of magnitude more than what they were expecting. Um, so the, how do you evaluate it? How do you certify it? Um, again, the integration and the legal compliance aspects of the open source software as well as management over time. How is it going to be updated? Who's going to do that? Who's going to support it? And how are you going to continue to understand what's in place? So FOSS Bazaar is really built, again, around talking about all those issues. And they're not, they're not very well understood at all right now, right? I mean, you've got, you've got cases where um, Code Providence is a good example, right? There are companies like Black Duck who work on understanding and helping you understand where the software in your product came from if it came from an open source origination, right? So understanding that where the software came from so that you don't uh, incorrectly mix open source, particularly GPL software with proprietary software is one of the things they work on. Um, it's a really hard problem to solve. And it's a problem that by and large, most folks don't worry about for commercial software. Right? You never really care or wonder about where software came from in any of your commercial products. Um, and a lot of that is because you get indemnified. Right? So another thing that doesn't come with open source software is indemnification. Um, the open source community is not going to indemnify any user if some, some piece of that software is found to infringe on a patent and the patent troll is now trying to sue. Right? So this is a gap. With, um, with open source software versus commercial software. And there are ways to mitigate that gap. And you can go extremely conservative, and you can go out and buy insurance that is IP litigation insurance. And it's extremely expensive. Uh, but if you're really, really risk averse, that might be a direction you want to go. Right? Or you can understand what the community would do and how organizations such as um, Grok Law, <coughs> um, the Open Invention Network, and so forth would help you in defending any kind of patent action that would occur on, on various pieces of open source software. So it's all a matter of education. Um, and once each issue is understood, then each individual consumer of the open source software can figure out on what level of spectrum or, or where in that spectrum they fall as far as risk aversion. So, Key topics inside of FOSS Bazaar and what we focus on is, again, all targeted towards um, managers and folks responsible for software assets in organizations that, by and large, aren't developers. <clears throat> so we care about and the, the topics that we cover are getting started in open source governance, governance maturity, IP issues, 
intellectual property issues, license compliance, lifecycle management, um, how to track in your open source inventory, setting up a policy and a process for uh, managing open source inside of an organization, uh, tracking those security and vulnerabilities, software acquisition, and supportability. So here's a list of some of the key resources that are currently on FOSS Bazaar. Um, it's, a, it's a fledgling effort. We started this and launched it on January 24th of this year. Um, and it's really, like I said, it's, its premise is that it needs to be a user innovation network and one that's focused on um, intellectual property and materials around how to best manage open source, right? So um, we continue to look for more folks to help, to help participate. Again, we think that early adopters such as Google, such as HP, the other members of the foundation um, that we have, and there are many other tech companies that we know are early adopters of open source software. They've figured out a lot of these problems, right? And so the, the intent here is to try to cross the chasm that I described between early adopter and early majority by having those early adopters have a, man, a method Right, to actually uh, push the dialogue, push the understanding of how to manage open source software to that early majority. And because we don't find that adoption of open source is ever being held up by the development staff. That's not the case. Right? It's always the case that the development staff knows there's a widget out there that they can use, does exactly what they want. They want to be able to put it into their code and not have to reinvent the wheel. But there's all of this uncertainty when they actually try to get approval into their organization. So by educating their organization on what's right, what's wrong, what's manageable, what's not, then that whole flow and that whole adoption process of open source can then be increased. So that's the point. It's kind of different. It's not, like I said, it's not an open source project. It's targeted at a different audience. Um, but the expectation is that it will ultimately help the open source community because it will free those barriers, those inhibitors, which are mostly based around just an un under an area of you know, unquantified risk because the management involved in having to say yes to any piece of open source coming into the organization isn't, um, they don't have, they're not well informed. So this is, this is built to inform them. So we ask for your participation. If you got a question around open source governance that, that you've always wondered, put it out there. Let's, let's, let's have a discussion about it. Um, if you see a topic missing out on the site, then and then tell us and, and, and add it. And if you find something incorrect, point it out to us so that we can fix it. It's all about a collaborative effort to build best practices. So with that, then I'm going to go on to our next project, which is called Fossology. So HP open sourced the tools that we built to help us manage our open source software. Um, and we open sourced those about December 18th of, of last year. Um, the way HP is organized and the fact that we ship so many products with open source software, one of our first and most important um, uh, issues was license compliance. We wanted to make sure that we were abiding by all of the open source licenses in the software we were shipping. Excuse me. So we've actually gone through three generations of the license detector. Um, and it... Uh, it's, it's now rather sophisticated. I'm going to show, a, uh, I'm going to show a, uh, uh, a demo here in just a few minutes. But we realized when we were talking to customers um, and to others, as well as folks in the academic community, that there's the cool thing about open source software, well, one of the cool things about open source software, is that it is, it is so transparent and so easy to see, right? You can track the project. You can track the folks working on it. You have the code, so you can try to measure its um, its complexity, you can identify the dependencies across everything, you can look and scan for licenses, um, you can look and scan to see how often different snippets of code were used um, throughout it. There's lots of studies that you can do on the open source software, um, and we found that, or we thought that building a tool that would actually allow anybody to write their own little agent to study some aspect of open source software, and then put it in a database that anybody else could use, would be, an interesting, uh, would be an interesting idea. So that's, 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 that's a large goal of what Fossology is. Um, another thought was 
that um, in many of organizations that we talked to, you know, what they really wanted was they wanted a procurement office for open source. They went someplace in the organization, like I believe is um, part of the open source programs office here at Google, where that organization is responsible for identifying and tracking what open source comes into the organization and keeping tabs on it, right, so that it doesn't have to be done by all the individual developers. So this tool, Fossology, is geared towards that librarian or that procurement office role as well. And with that, I'll go ahead and, uh, and roll, the, uh, roll the demo. Welcome to a quick look at the new Fossology user interface. This video is to show you what we've been working on and what you can expect to see in the next release. The screenshots were taken on March 17, 2008, running code from a development directory. This directory has been available on our Subvergen repository for a couple of months now. We're going to move the new UI code from this directory to the main UI directory as soon as we do a little more testing. An official release, version 0.7.0, will follow that in the not too distant future. Please keep in mind that I'm only showing a snapshot of current development. Expect some changes before the release. We didn't redo the interface just because it felt wrong. Mr. Spock, the ship feels wrong. Feels, Mr. Scott. I know it doesn't make sense. Instrumentation reads correct, but the feel is wrong. Although that's sometimes good enough reason for change. And it isn't just a cosmetic makeover, or as some people like to say, it isn't just new lipstick on a pig. The entire user interface was rewritten from scratch to make it more flexible and with a plug-in architecture so that new features could be added easily. We still need to put up documentation on how to program new plugins, but for now, if you're interested in writing your own plugins, just look at the code in the development user interface directory. There are plenty of examples to follow. Okay, are you ready to see it? Show me this unit. I wish to learn. We have a new look. Notice the menu bar in the top and a login link on the right. For now, we only have rudimentary authorization. We felt that these authorization levels were what we needed to get started on a public repository. Let's look at the browse function. Notice that the folder navigation doesn't appear until this is selected. In the old user interface, the folder navigation was always there, but that wasted a lot of space since it wasn't always meaningful to some of the functions. Now let's browse through one of the RHEL 4 source disks. Over here on the right in the yellow bar, we have what we like to call a mini menu. This is a context specific menu for the current window, which is browse. In this window, you'll also notice view and meta actions. These are specific to the listed files. I guess this isn't the best example since there's only one file, the ISO, but we'll see more later. View will view the file. And don't worry, it'll be paged and in a readable format so you don't have to worry about a gigabyte binary file being sent to your display. Meta shows the metadata we have about the file. Right now, this is pretty simple since we only display metadata that was stored in the file itself. Several file types like ISOs, RPMs, DEBs, images have metadata in the file. The volume ID, CD format, block size, the stuff you'd expect. Notice that the path in the yellow banner says that we're looking at a file called artifact.meta. Fossology creates files called artifact.meta when it finds a container, like a gzip or ISO, that can contain metadata in its own file header. This data wouldn't be discovered in the files the archive contains, so we created a file. Now, let's browse through the ISO. Notice how the path is being built in the yellow banner? Every time we find a container, we start a new line. This makes the path and its or the file's origin much easier to see. I've clicked down until I'm in the hxplay106 directory. Let's do an analysis. 
I propose to run an analysis through the ship's computers comparing the present condition of the Enterprise with her ideal condition. Mr. Spock, we don't have time for that. Whoops. Wrong analysis. Let's find all the licenses in all the files in this directory and the directories underneath this one. Notice that the word licenses are hyperlinked. Clicking on these will show, on the left, what licenses are contained in these directories. Pretty cool, huh? The file names and directories on the right are also hyperlinked. They allow you to continue browsing in the license browser. Now I've gone into the player directory and see all the licenses in this part of the file tree. Again, clicking on licenses shows what licenses are in this directory. But what about the opposite? Can I click on a license and see what directory that license is in? Yes, indeed. OK, that's cool. But what does the show link do? It shows you the files with this license. In this case, there are four instances of the Pine license, and they happen to be in four files. Let's look at the new search capability. It's a simple search on file names, and far from what we want search to ultimately be. But it's a start. OK. Let's find files whose names start with SSH. Since this string just gets popped into the light clause of a select SQL statement, I'm entering SSH followed by a wildcard, the percent character. Scrolling down, we see the results. Hey, what is this? Why are these results indented? This is showing identical files. The script SSHD2 is found under RPMs and SRPMs. That's not a big surprise for a script. If you want to see the script, just click on it. But I'm not going to do that now. I'd like to show you a license report. Since every name in the path in the yellow bar is clickable, I'm going to click on the logwatch tar.gz so I can browse its contents. Notice that I'm in the file browser. I want to see licenses in this tar, so I'll click on licenses in the context-specific micromenu. You've seen this before. But it's fun to see what licenses are where and what files and directories contain what licenses. You may find this functionality more than just fun if you're vetting specific code for licenses. Enough of that. I'm going to click on Show so that you can see the files that contain these GPL references. I see four different files. Remember, if these were the same file but under different names or different paths, I would see these grouped like we saw before. Let's click on ClamAV and look at its licenses. OK, there's the file and the license highlighted in yellow with all the words and symbols that our pattern matcher found in the reference license. To see the reference license, just click ref, like I'm doing now. The reference license is also highlighted with the words we found in the ClamAV file. Notice that in ClamAV, the pound symbols weren't in the reference license, and the reference license highlighting shows that the last paragraph was not included in ClamAV. You may have noticed that this doesn't look like it should be called a 94% match since the whole last paragraph of the, license, the reference license was not included in ClamAV. One of our astute contributors also noticed this, and we've since fixed our percent calculation. Thanks goes to Daniel German at the University of Victoria for catching that. OK, let's wrap this up by showing some more things in Browse. I'm going to click on SRPMs to jump to that directory in this ISO. Let's pick a random RPM, like Image Magic, and click Meta. Here's another one of those artifact.meta files. An RPM has metadata, and here it is. Let's look at some of the other top-level menu items. This is going to be fast, since these still need to be fleshed out a bit. Remember show jobs in the old UI? Now we have something similar, but have added a new feature called By Upload. Let's say you uploaded something to the repository and want to know what the job status is specifically for that upload. This is something that we do quite a bit, actually. I'll click on this Debian ISO, and we can see that this job completed without errors. Clicking on Details in the micro menu shows us much more information about jobs related to this ISO we uploaded. How about the Admin menu? This menu is all about information you might want to know about running Phosology. We only have two items in there now, but you can expect uh, quite a few more to come. Here's the dashboard to show you disk and database statistics. So there it is, a quick run through of the new user interface. We hope you like it. 
As always, we welcome participation in Fossology, code development, bug reports, documentation, suggestions. We appreciate it all. So long, Fossologists. See you next time. All right, so that was a brief tour of uh, what Fossology does. So just in summary, you know, what both FossBazaar and Fossology are trying to do is help build an understanding around policy, process, and tools um, in managing open source software inside of enterprises, institutions, and governments. Um, FossBazaar focuses on understanding what are the topics uh, to build a good policy, what are the right ways to instantiate that process that enforces the policy, and Fossology is um, the start of a set of tools that will uh, help enforce or help, be, uh, help organizations implement that policy. Um, with that, uh, I'll take questions. Yes, Kat. What kind of uptake have you gotten so far, Bill, in terms of people signing up and getting involved in the community? So with regard to Foss Bazaar, we've got about 200 registered users now since we started. Um, we still get about 1,000 hits a day um, on the site. Uh, you know, there's all kinds of stuff going on in the news all the time um, around open source software. The latest, I think, is probably the settlement of the Verizon case with the uh, BusyBox folks and the SFLC. Um, you know, prior to that, there was the whole interoperability um, discussion going on around Microsoft and what it is they were doing. Uh, with regard to open source software and how that related to their interoperability um, statements. So there's always something going on. There's always some kind of current events that are going on. And then we also have, again, discussion topics around, again, what is the right way to do uh, code providence? Right? You can take it to a couple of different extremes, and somewhere in the middle is probably the right answer. And uh, we continue to drive to get discussion on those topics so that um, that best answer can be found. Any other questions? All right, well, with that, I thank you for your attention.